So um, the, remember the title for today is what every parent needs to know about adolescent substance use with Dr. Danielle Dick from Rutgers. And it's my pleasure to let you know um, that she strongly leads the university-wide Rutgers Addiction Research Center and Brain Health Institute. She's a professor of psychology and genetics and the author of The Child Code, uh, which I have uh, enjoyed reading as well as listening to on Audible and can't wait for you to hear more about her book. She's by far an expert on genetics and environmental influences. She has led the way in acquiring over 25 grants with the National Institutes of Health. And she is, incited, she is cited in over 400 peer-reviewed publications focusing on mental health, addiction, and genetics, um, all the things that Operation Parent loves and um, enjoys assisting parents on learning more. She's one of the most highly cited researchers in the world. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce you to her this afternoon, let you spend some time with her and learn more about her very meaningful and important work. It's been a pleasure getting to know her and I'm, I'm happy for you to do that as well. Thank you. We're looking forward to it. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle, and to everyone at Operation Parent for inviting me to be here with you all today, and to all the parents that are out there. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. So as Michelle mentioned, my day job is really that I am a professor of psychology and genetics. I am on the faculty at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at Rutgers in the Department of Psychiatry where I lead the Rutgers Addiction Research Center, which is actually the largest addiction research center in the world. We have over 150 researchers who do everything from basic science, neuroscience, genetics, all the way through to epidemiology, etiology, prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, policy. So we really have you know, a large group of people who are coming together to think about how to tackle these challenging problems. One of my real passions is how we can bring research to the people who can use it. And that's what led me to write the book that Michelle mentioned, The Child Code, which was published by Penguin Random House uh, a couple of years ago now. And it was really my effort as a fellow parent, my other qualification in this realm is that I am the parent to a seven-year-old and a 17-year-old. So I'm in the trenches with you all. And as I became a parent and I really started paying attention to so much of what was out there for parents, which quite honestly, since I was trained in developmental and clinical psychology, I didn't really look at a lot of what was out in the popular press before that, but I became struck by how much of the messages and information that we get out there don't always match the research. And so what I really try and do is to bring all of this cutting edge research that I have the opportunity to be a part of to people who can use it. My own research focuses on why some people are more at risk of developing problems with addiction than others. And I study both you know, how part of that lies in our genes and part of it's in our environments and how does that come together across development? And I'll be talking more about that at a future uh, talk that Michelle was mentioning. But one of the things that I find most interesting about this work and about studying substance use disorders is that no one wakes up one morning and discovers that they've had an onset of alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder overnight. In fact, most of these problems are preceded by a trajectory of risk-related behavior. And that means that a lot of my work in understanding why some kids are more at risk than others focuses on adolescence. And so really that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about really the current trends in adolescent alcohol use. I'll be talking a little bit about why some kids are more at risk than others, which I'll really go into in depth next month. And then I'm going to be talking about take home useful information for what us as parents can do to reduce the likelihood that our kids will develop problems with substance use 
or other kinds of addictive behaviors that are increasingly being legalized now, like gambling and uh, gaming, that's a part of our kids' lives. So the reality is that one in four individuals over the age of 18 becomes affected with a substance use or a related behavioral disorder at some point in their life. And it's a really large societal problem, but an also a really interesting and challenging puzzle in the sense that the vast majority of people, over 85%, choose to use alcohol or other drugs recreationally, but a quarter will develop problems. And the reason that we talk so much about adolescence to young adulthood is because that is the onset period, both when individuals are usually starting to experiment and use but it is also the age of onset for most of these problems. So what I'm gonna talk about today is why. So I am an endowed chair in neuroscience, and so I think a lot about the brain, and the reality is you can't understand behavior without understanding what's going on in the brain. And across adolescence into emerging adulthood, our kids' brains are undergoing really rapid development. So what this graph shows, what this differing colors, is how the connections of the brain are literally changing as they are growing across time. And the interesting thing about brain development is it happens in a way that, as neuroscientists, we call asynchronous, meaning some parts of the brain finish their development earlier than other parts of the brain. So the part of the brain that is done maturing, growing, that is in its final state first, is the part of the brain that registers reward. And from an evolutionary perspective, you can think about why this is very useful, because if you don't seek out pleasurable things, food, sex, other kinds of things that are critical for staying alive and reproducing for the next generation to be around, then in fact, the human species wouldn't have survived. But the other thing we know is that the part of the brain that develops last is the part of the brain that helps us think through the consequences of our actions. So, Teenagers have brains that are fully developed when it comes to reward. This is why they really want to be surrounded by their peers, be trying new things. It's what leads to a lot of their kind of risk-taking behavior. They're trying out and exploring new opportunities. But that part of the brain that helps them check and think through huh, is this a good idea? What are the long-term ramifications of that is not fully developed until about the mid-20s. And in fact, there's some evidence that it's even a little bit later in men than in women, which will leave aside any jokes that us women might want to make about that. But regardless, it means our kids are going to be, brains are going to be developing for quite some time still. And this is why adolescents do these ridiculous things that we can just look at them and think, what were they thinking? And in fact, the reality is they are thinking, but their brains just do not function the way that our brains as fully developed adults do. They have the, these brains that are wired for reward and risk-taking that do not naturally think through the consequences of those actions. They're primed for what's in front of them right now. So when I talk to adolescents, I always talk about how, in fact, your brain is not always gonna set you up for success at this age because it's primed to be excited by things that are right in front of you. But for example, I do a lot of work with college students. When that person shows up at your door and says, hey, let's go to this party tonight, your brain's immediately gonna go, that sounds like fun. There might be friends you wanna see, there might be romantic interests there, but you literally have to stop and think through, huh, if I want to go on to medical school, that means I should probably study because otherwise I won't do as well on the test tomorrow, my GPA might not be as good, then I won't be as, it won't be as easy for me to apply and get into med school. That's 
a lot of higher level cognitive processing. That friend is at the door with something fun right here, right now. And so adolescents really have to kind of train themselves to stop and to think about those consequences because their brains don't naturally do it for them. So what does this look like when it comes to substance use? So you can imagine this sets kids up for some risky patterns because substances are generally available right in front of them if they're at a party or with friends or other things. They have friends, things that they find highly rewarding that are sometimes pressuring them to try or to use. The idea of pushing the edge of the envelope, which is developmentally normative, again, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, kids had to leave their parents and seek out new people, new mates, et cetera. So the idea that they'd wanna try new things is something that is also kind of natural for their phase of development. When you look at something like alcohol use, these are data from monitoring the future. And so just to orient you to this slide, um, this is showing the prevalence, this happens to be across time here, prevalence among eighth graders in blue, among 10th graders in red, and among 12th graders here in purple. And so this is a study that's been going on for decades and it tracks trends in substance use and other kinds of behaviors as individuals move across adolescence, and it has for some time now. And so you can see that although many adolescents, you know, the slight majority, report that they have used alcohol in the past year by the time they get to uh, the end of high school here, in fact, there is still a substantial majority that are choosing not to use alcohol. And the reason that I mention this is because actually rates of alcohol use have gone down since the time many of us were in adolescence. Um, they peaked around 75% uh, some decades back, you know, when I was in adolescence, and now they have been slowly declining. Our kids are actually making healthier choices than we did. They also have a lot more parental supervision, which probably plays a role than we did a generation ago too. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But I mention it because we don't want to inadvertently give kids the idea that like, oh, kids will be kids. Everybody's experimenting. Everybody's using alcohol because that's not the case when you look at the data. The kids we most worry about, of course, are the ones that are displaying heavy patterns of drinking, binge drinking, or what we sometimes call heavy episodic drinking, uh, which is defined as four or five drinks, depending on whether you're a female or male, in a short period of time. And in showing you some data here from uh, a study that we ran at a large Midwestern university where we were surveying incoming freshmen and we were asking, when you drink, how much do you drink? These are among the students who reported some level of alcohol use. Again, I think this really kind of nicely shows this point that a lot of kids, even among those who are using now when they're in a college setting, this is as a college freshmen, are reporting that they're drinking one or two drinks, maybe three or four drinks here. But the ones that we most worry about, and you can see this is pretty consistent across cohorts, are the kids who are reporting that their typical drinking pattern is seven, eight, or nine, or 10 plus drinks. And of course, this is really a double whammy of risk in the sense that even if these individuals don't go on to develop problems, we know that drinking at that level can be extremely dangerous, both in terms of if you drink too much, you know, of course, you can also die, but that's where injuries happen, kids fall off roofs, they get behind the wheel of a car, and where really life altering, uh, devastating consequences can happen. In addition, drinking at that kind of level also has an effect on the developing brain, which we'll talk a bit more about too. Unfortunately, kids are really susceptible to this heavy pattern of alcohol use. And this is in part a function of the way that alcohol works. So alcohol is an interesting drug in the sense that it has 
these differing effects on the body depending on where you are on the blood alcohol concentration curve here. So when you, at the beginning, alcohol has a stimulant effect. It essentially, you know, makes you feel a little buzzed, feel good, feel more sociable. Now, if we think of adolescent brains that are primed to think this is great, more is going to be better, that then tends to lead them into this pattern of, I like this. What do I like? I'm going to try more of. Unfortunately, the way that the drug works is that as you drink more alcohol and your blood alcohol concentration continues to grow, then we know that there are sedative effects associated with the drug. That's where you start slurring your words, falling asleep, et cetera. And of course, at extremely high levels, it's where respiration can actually um, stop and that's how individuals can die. The unfortunate bit with adolescence is that because their brains are undergoing so much development, they are actually affected in alcohol, affected by alcohol in different ways. So they are less sensitive to those motor in coordination, those sedative kind of effects, feeling sleepier, the things that are our body's natural way of kind of saying, ooh, slow down. Adolescents don't experience that to the same effect. In addition, they're more sensitive to the harmful effects of alcohol on learning and memory because their brains are undergoing such rapid development. So one of the you know, pretty, I think, striking findings that's come out of the field is that the younger an individual starts drinking, the greater the likelihood that they will go on to develop problems. And so these are data from a large national study in which shown along here on the bottom axis is the age at which people started drinking. So this bar is individuals who started drinking at 13 or younger, all the way up to those who started drinking at 21 or over. And this is the number of individuals, the percentage of individuals who develop an alcohol use disorder. And so as you can see, among those who start drinking at a young age, over 45% of them go on to develop an alcohol problem. As compared to among individuals who wait until they're 21 or older, legal drinking age, they are far less likely, less than 10% of them go on to develop problems. And the reason for this is probably twofold. That one, the kids who are initiating and starting to use early are carrying more risk factors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end and even more so in March. But in addition, when you start to use alcohol at those heavy levels starting at a young age, it changes the way that our brains are actually growing and processing reward. And so if you think about the effects of drugs, it's to produce that immediate kind of high, that rewarding feeling. What that does is it essentially makes, as people develop problems, other rewards, the naturally occurring things that are rewarding in life, you know, being with your family, with your friends, with loved ones, doing your hobbies or things you enjoy, it makes those naturally rewarding things start to pale in comparison. Because, you know, as much as I love my husband and my children, they are always rewarding every single interaction I have with them. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we could all probably recognize that. In contrast, Drugs produce that same rewarding effect every time. But not only that, because you develop tolerance, you actually need a little more of them to keep getting that same rewarding effect. And so you can see how individuals then start to fall into a cycle of addiction that is essentially starting with early risk factors. And then when you start using a substance, especially in heavier ways, it actually further changes your brain. Another thing that many of us in the substance use research world are really worried about right now is cannabis use. So there is growing evidence that when used in high quantities, cannabis might even be more harmful for developing brains than alcohol use. 
This becomes really relevant because, of course, there has been growing uh, legalization of cannabis, whether for medicinal or and or recreational purposes across the states. And this chart nicely shows where that stands with most states having legalized some form of cannabis use. If we look at what percentage of kids are using marijuana, uh, overall it's lower uh, than alcohol use. So you can see that by 12th grade, about a third of students say that they are using alcohol use, or excuse me, using marijuana. Uh, in our college st studies, we find about that jumps to about 42% among our incoming freshmen say that they've used alcohol in the past year. But what most concerns us again is this smaller percentage of students who are using in heavy ways. So daily marijuana use. It is much easier, and there are far more kids who are using marijuana daily than her use, who are using alcohol daily. It's far easier to use marijuana on a daily basis. And it's that sort of repeated increased exposure to a drug that appears to be particularly harmful on developing brains. And so we know that there's a dose response where, you know, the adolescent who is trying marijuana, you know, a few times here or there, maybe kind of like trying alcohol a few times here or there. Of course, there's always the danger that if you're using in high quantities, there could be an adverse experience or consequence. But in terms of long-term effects on developing brains, that's not what we're as worried about. We're more worried about these kids who are using regularly. And the growing evidence is that using marijuana on this sort of regular basis has the biggest impact on memory and motivation in kids. And if you think about this, what are our kids' jobs when they are teenagers into emerging adults? It is to go to school, to do their homework, to go to their jobs. What gets impacted really adversely when they are their memory and motivation is impacted? their performance at school, at work. And so we worry about it a lot because on college campuses, what we're seeing is that these kids who are using marijuana daily, not only is it impacting these other areas of their life, but the other kind of you know nefarious thing about the drug is that because it impacts motivation, they also don't really care. And that's different than what we see in alcohol, where when it is really adversing, uh, adversely affecting adolescents' lives, they might not be able to curb it immediately, but they generally are upset by it. But we're seeing that that's not the case with marijuana, and that's one of the reasons we're particularly concerned. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know what the big deal is, right? Um, you know, the, the running joke among some folks who work in this field is they'll talk to parents and say, like, I don't understand why everybody is so worried. You know, I smoked a little grass back in the day and it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, back in the day, what you were smoking was probably not much more potent than grass. So the average THC levels and THC being the psychoactive ingredient in um, cannabis that gives it its potent effects it was about 3% back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. What happened then was as states began to legalize that marijuana growers were experimenting with different breeds of plants. And then like any farmer, what sells well, they do more of. What was selling well were increasingly potent forms of marijuana. And so, by the early you know, 2010s, that potency had jumped up to about 13%. Now it has jumped to about 25%. So this is eight times stronger than the marijuana that existed when most all of us were teens. Not only that, but when you look at edibles, gummies, things, products like that, they will have a potency of on average 80 to 90 percent. Of course, who's attracted to things like gummies? Very often, it's teenagers. 
So this is a very different drug than the marijuana of our youth. And that's one of the reasons we're particularly concerned about the effects it might be having, especially when youth are using regularly. With increasing legalization, what we're seeing is more availability and acceptance. We know that the two things that most impact whether adolescents are using a substance is availability and access, excuse me, availability, access, and acceptability. So as people see it being legalized and think, oh, it must not be dangerous, it must be safe, it's being used for medicinal purposes, it can really change adolescents' minds about whether they think that this is a dangerous drug or something that why not be using it daily? And so one of the things we really want to do is educate parents about this so that you are aware and can talk to your kids about it. And while we're worrying, I'm sorry, I don't really mean to be the bearer of bad news, but the reality is that the landscape of substances is very different in our kids. Nicotine vaping, which now a lot of parents think are aware of and have heard of, is one of the top forms of substance use among teens. And so if you look at the National Youth Tobacco Survey, about one in four students say that they have uh, tried vaping. Right now, most vaping is with disposables. Most kids have been using flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, in fact, there was this perception that well, maybe they're more, they're safer, they're not as dangerous, particularly among kids. The FDA a few years back produced this consensus report really showing that um, e-cigarettes still contain toxic substances. Of course, they were originally developed to help people who were smoking cigarettes either reduce or quit. And compared to individuals who are smoking cigarettes, yes, when because it's not burning, there were uh, less carcinogenic properties. However, depending on the device, which varies a ton in extremely complicated ways that are difficult to keep up with, they can still be releasing large numbers of carcinogens. Um, they still have a number of toxic byproducts. Of course, what got us into this and really what led teens into this being on their radar and being so popular was originally the sales of jewels, which this um, product, this graph, I think, really nicely illustrates just how there has been an exponential growth in the sale of these products. Of course, the government has eventually cracked down on jewel and marketing that it was doing that really appeared to be largely targeted toward teens. But even though you might not have jewel on the shelves anymore, you know. Would you recognize this as a tobacco product? These are disposables. Look how fun they look. Or even other new products, Zin. You might have heard your adolescents talk about Zimbabwe's fun, bright colored little nicotine pouches. You can just stick under your lip and they will use them before taking tests or other kinds of things. So it's important to, it's really difficult to keep up with the changing landscape. I know that there was a webinar uh, that Operation Parent hosted all about vaping, and so I encourage you to check that out in the library. And I'll end for a moment by talking about, of course, the thing that is so frequently in the news now um, and that so many parents are concerned about, which is overdose deaths with respect to opioids. Uh, what this graph shows is you can see there's been this uptick in deaths, but really this um, large increase has been due to synthetic opioids, to fentanyl. Uh, unfortunately, much of the drug supply, not just opiates, but cocaine, ketamine, other sorts of you know psychedelics is now coming in powdered forms which have origins in Asia and then are funneled up through Central and South America, Central, South and Central America. They are very often passed through many hands and they are often mixed with things like fentanyl now, which are very potent and are contributing to these overdose deaths. When I talk to kids, I always say, you know, I, I'm not up here to try and scare you, 
But the unfortunate reality is that our kids live in a far more dangerous drug landscape than we did. So what is a parent to do? Many of us might have grown up in the days of dare and the this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Unfortunately, we know that scare tactics don't work. Those campaigns were very largely ineffective and actually changing students' substance use. And in fact, some interesting studies show that, if anything, teens sometimes overestimate how dangerous drugs are, but that doesn't change the likelihood that they'll use them. Again, think about where their brains are and that primed for reward and not thinking about consequences. So we know that scare tactics don't really work. That doesn't mean that parents don't have an important role to play. So if we were all together, I'd you know, ask for those who might volunteer with what the, their guesses on what the number one thing that impacts early adolescent alcohol use. I find that sometimes, you know, parents will guess, oh, is it, um, you know, having alcohol uh, in the home? Is it having parents who use? Is it maybe having friends that use? In a sense, all of those things are related, but the number one thing that impacts whether or not kids are using early in adolescence is access. So, Kids can't be experimenting with alcohol or other drugs if they don't have access to it. And of course, there's many places that our kids can get access to substances. And that means that the number one thing that parents can do to curb risky substance use in their kids is parental monitoring. So it isn't having a close relationship, spending time with them. All those things are really important, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but the number one thing that research study after research study shows that curbs adolescent substance use is whether parents are asking who their kids are with, what they're doing, where they're going, is there gonna be alcohol, essentially reducing easy access to alcohol in the home. I sometimes say that, you know, if you have, I grew up with the lovely crystal decanters with uh, you know, different liqueurs sitting on the uh, dining room buffet there. And uh, you know, if you do that, then you run the risk that that vodka will be half water by the time you know, your adolescent graduates from high school. So it's not just access in the home though, of course, it's are they out with other adolescents in places where they could be using with older adolescents who might give them access to substances, et cetera. So what can we do in addition to asking our kids where they're going, who they're gonna be with, what they're doing? The other really important thing that we need to do is talk to our kids about what I sometimes call the hard stuff. We think back to when they were little and the amount of time many of us spent obsessing over what baby food or should we bottle feed or, you know, were there plastics getting into their, you know, um, their, their, their food or whatnot. Very often we spend a lot of time worrying about things when our kids are little, but we don't want to talk to them about what I sometimes call the really big things that could actually have huge adverse effects on their life. Things like drugs, sex. So we need to talk to our kids about the hard stuff. This is not a one and done conversation. This is not a, okay, I've had the talk about alcohol and checked that off and now I'm done. What you really wanna do is have open lines of communication with your kids. And regardless of what age your kids are, earlier is always better. And so I started talking to my kids about this. You know, it's amazing actually how young it comes up, right? They, they might be little kids and they'll say, oh, can I have a sip of that? And you would say, you know, no, this has alcohol in it and that's something that only grownups can drink. And that's probably enough for a four or five year old. As they get older, they're teenagers, they might say, well, why is it okay for you to drink alcohol, but I can't drink alcohol? And that's where really being armed with the knowledge about 
Well, the reality is your brain is still developing. And part of my job as a parent is to help keep you safe. And alcohol is something that can adversely affect your brain development. That's why my brain, this is as good as it's gonna get. So that's why it's different when adults drink alcohol than when teenagers drink alcohol. You can also do this by asking your kids questions. So rather than coming in, you know, hard and fast with don't do, don't do alcohol, don't do drugs, this is the role, you're gonna be in trouble. Now, there's good among some of those things, establishing boundaries, et cetera, but what you really want to do is to start a dialogue with your kids. So you might be watching a movie or maybe they'll come home after school today and you can say, oh, I was in this webinar today. And they were talking about all these different forms of drugs. Or if you're watching a movie, gosh, there's a lot of teenagers that they're showing, you know, vaping in this movie or that they're showing using alcohol or, you know, smoking. Do you know a lot of kids who do that? Or, you know, are there many people at your school or have you ever been offered a vape? Those are ways to start the conversation about kids, uh, with kids about these kinds of topics. And then you can ask them, you know, what do you think about that? And the reality is that you are the parent, you get to set the rules. And so you do want to be clear about your rules and the reasons behind those rules. And so it's good for you to, before you're having these conversations with your kids, to have thought through what are the rules going to be in your house. In my rule, in my house, the rules are no drinking until you're 21. The reality is that it's both, you know, that's when it's legal, but also because as a parent and the reality is as a researcher who studies the effects of drugs on developing brains, I know that it's not good for your brain and it's my job to keep you healthy. So that's the rule in our house and that's why. It's not because I don't trust you. It's not because you know, I don't want you to fit in with your peers. And when you get the like, mom, but everybody's doing it and, or nobody's gonna like me, or, you know, what am I gonna do if I go to this party and everybody's using it? I'm gonna look like a dork if I'm the only one who's not. That's where you can also help your kids with skills. So things that, for example, we talk to our college students about is, you know, or you might talk to your teenager about if, if you are going to allow them to be at parties where there's alcohol or they find themselves there, nobody knows what's in that red Solo cup. It can just as easily be water or a Sprite or a soda as it is something else. And so that could be one of the ways that they could not even have to address it and you know, be holding a cup like their peers, for example. Or you can come up with language that they feel comfortable with as a way to just sort of say no. I always tell my son, feel free to throw me under the bus. Say, oh, my mom, you know, she would kill me. So I absolutely can't because I'm gonna be grounded forever. So think with your teenager about what are the potential places, what are the concerns they might have with your rules? What are some of the ways that you can help them think through alternative strategies that are still safe for them, but you know might not then have the things that the, they worry about? For example, adverse social consequences if they are choosing not to use and some of their peers are. And then the last thing, of course, is that you need to also, kids learn by having consequences as well. And I always tell other parents, it is of course normal that your kids are gonna wanna push the edge of the envelope. That is a normal developmental task, uh, if you will, as a psychologist call it. And so having a plan for what you're gonna do when your child breaks the rules that you have discussed, because even if you've had all the conversations, our kids' brains are still developing, they're not perfect, and so how are you going to handle that circumstance? And we know that very often kids learn from the consequences of their actions. And so having thought through what are those consequences gonna be ahead of time is also helpful for parents. 
I like to address what I sometimes call, you know, the fact versus fiction. And these are questions that come up from uh, parents as I've spoken to them over the years. One is, should I socialize my child to be more responsible with alcohol? In other words, would it be better if I allow them to try alcohol or maybe drink with me or the family at home or with a meal or on holiday occasions? Or would it be better if, you know, I allowed the other kids to come to my house because that might be less dangerous? You know, I'd remind parents that, in fact, giving alcohol to other children um, is illegal. And there have definitely been cases where parents have been prosecuted. So that's something one wants to keep in mind. In many states, it's not illegal, though, to give alcohol to your own child. And so many parents rightly ask me, well, would that be a good thing to kind of, you know, help them learn to drink responsibly? Or what I very often call the European myth, because they'll say, you know, like in France, you see kids out having a glass of wine with their parents or at the dinner table. It turns out that actually the, the idea that by being socialized or introduced to alcohol at an earlier age, as many is the case in many European cultures, it does not at all result in a reduced level of alcohol use or binge drinking in adolescents. In fact, in Europe, adolescents have much higher rates of binge drinking and heavy alcohol use than they do in the United States. So you might see that child having a nice responsible glass of wine with their parents, you know, at, out at a restaurant, but all the data suggests that when that child is not with those parents, it does not translate into any more responsible behavior when they are with their friends. In fact, what we know is that the increased acceptability and access, because many European countries also have alcohol that is available at a lower drinking age, translates into much higher rates of risky drinking. Of course, it comes back down to adolescents' brains are at a different place than adult brains. So when they have access to it and they're around their peers, very often they tend to use in risky ways. Most adolescents are not having a glass of wine with dinner. They are out engaging in high levels of alcohol use with their peers. This wouldn't it be safer for them to drink under my supervision since they're gonna do it anyway. I really wanna challenge you on this one. And this is why I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that in fact, it isn't the case that all adolescents use alcohol. In fact, a higher percentage of kids did when we were younger, but we don't inadvertently want to pass that message on that we just expect that they're going to or that all kids are using because that's certainly not the case. And then the last one is, you know, well, I have a great relationship with my child. I don't think they would ever fill in the blank with your favorite mischievous behavior that you can never imagine your child doing. And in fact, you know, kids all are different and I'll talk about that in a moment, but the other piece is that where kids' brains are not fully developed and processed to really be more attuned to reward and to peer influences does mean that when they have access and there is acceptance that it only takes one time for them to think, oh, why not? I'll just try it. And in fact, some of the kids who sadly end up experiencing really adverse consequences are kids for whom they try it, they have no tolerance, and um, and then they've you know really experienced harm from using in uh, in risky ways that are outside of their kind of normal behavior patterns. So something to still discuss with your child, even if you can't ever imagine them being the one to do fill in the blank. I've alluded to this, and I really want to just for a moment also talk about the fact that I've talked in generalities about adolescent brains, adolescent development, but of course there's a ton of variability in this, and we're not all equally at risk. That some 
individuals use more alcohol or are more likely to develop problems because of their unique combination of the genes that they got. It's the luck of the draw when it's the genes that we inherit from our parents and the environments that we experience. So we know that about 50%, about half of the differences between us all in how much people choose to use and the likelihood that they'll develop problems is due to differences in our DNA sequences. And the other half is found in differences in our environments. And that doesn't mean that for any one person that half of the reason they develop problems is in their genes and half is in their environments, but it means if we look generally across kids and why are some of them more likely to use in risky ways, about half of it is due to genetic dispositions. And in fact, we know that kids that are more impulsive or more emotional are at elevated risk. And if you're interested, um, my book, The Child Code, goes into the science behind this. You know, I sometimes say, if you just want to take my word for it, that kids' behavior is genetically influenced, you can then just skip to the middle part of the book, which is really surveys to sort of you know, look at where your kids fall on key dimensions, and then to understand a little bit about how different parenting strategies work differently, better or worse, for kids with different dispositions. The reality is that kids that are more impulsive or that are more emotional, more prone to kind of anxiety or depression, are at an elevated risk. And these are traits that vary continuously in the population. We impose a kind of cutoff, which is really pretty arbitrary, and say, okay, now kids at this upper end, now they may meet criteria for something like ADHD, or conduct disorder, or depression, or anxiety. But the reality is, this, this varies across the entire population. So when I sometimes have parents say, you know, is this normal that my child is so emotional, or so impulsive, or, you know, using substances in these heavy ways, I say, well, you know, everything is normal in the sense that, that it's all distributed like a bell curve. And so it's gonna be normal that some kids are gonna be at the upper end of that. But we can actually harness that information and knowing that these kids are most at, at risk to implement um, prevention strategies, to know it's even more important to be talking to our kids about substance use, et cetera. And I will go into much more details about what are some of the patterns and predictors that can indicate if your child is more at risk of developing problems in my talk in March. An important thing for schools and communities to remember as well is that we don't want to downplay concerns about adolescent substance use. Unfortunately, I have talked to too many parents whose kids have developed substance use problems, um, some of whom are in recovery now, some of whom are not yet in recovery, and they have told me that when they went to counselors or to their pediatrician, that they essentially were expressing concern about their child's use of alcohol or cannabis, and those concerns were dismissed. They were told, you know, hey, it's normal for kids to experiment. Don't worry about it. In fact, if someone tells you that, then you don't want to take that as an answer. Um, that kids who are experimenting, especially if they are using in regular patterns, you know, they're getting into that sort of regular pattern of use, you are 100% right to be following your gut as a parent and keep seeking out help until you find someone who will take it seriously. The other piece that we can all do is treat substance use disorders as the biomedical diseases that they are. And so the idea of responding with empathy, that individuals who are struggling often have enough shame that are putting them down. So if our kids are breaking the rules and they're using, and of course, many times use leads to really challenging behavior like stealing or talking back or you know, worse, very often our natural inclination is want to want to, you know, 
clamp down or respond with anger or talking down, you know, that's not okay. What are you doing? You're throwing your life away, etc. If we instead respond with empathy, I see you struggling. This is something that we can get help for. We are here to support you. We know that that actually is predictive of kids who can curb their substance use and get into recovery. We also know that recovery is a process. So if you have a child that is using in concerning or heavy or problematic ways, that it can often take multiple attempts to sustain abstinence or to move back to harm, to use that is not harmful. And that is, of course, because of both, you know, individuals who develop problems might have risk factors that make it harder for them to stop using. But in addition, those substances actually change the brain in ways that make it hard to stop as well. So as, it, as parents in our schools, in our communities as well, we really don't wanna downplay concerns about adolescent substance use, but we wanna treat problems and individuals who are experiencing problems with empathy and to help them get into the treatment that they need. Remember, you are not alone on this. And so uh, Michelle started out by mentioning that a lot of my work is funded by the National Institutes of Health, largely the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, as well as uh, NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Both of them have resources that are available for teens um, and for the parents of teens. Um, Child Mind Institute also has great resources about mental health. And the other side of this is that we know that anything that promotes well-being also can help kids in making smart and safe choices for their health. And I particularly like some of the resources available through the Greater Good Science Center. Oh, it looks like I might have lost control of the slides now. So Amanda or Michelle, who's advancing. Um, thank you for your attention today. I am happy to take any questions that you might have. One of the things, as I mentioned, is that I am passionate about doing more to get research out to parents and to the public and people who can use it. So this is where you can find me. This is where I put resources out for other parents um, and uh, to understand substance use, to understand about working with kids, what the research tells us. So I would encourage you to um, check out any of these resources as well for more information. Thank you for your time this morning and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Danielle. We're gonna go through a couple of Operation Parent slides while we get a few more questions in the queue. Um, we'd like to invite parents who are um, already might have a handbook to remember that they can go to the following pages and continue to strengthen those conversations with the teens that they love. So in our elementary um, edition, we cover alcohol, marijuana, and vaping. In our new middle and high edition, um, that's our ninth edition, uh, by the way, for anyone who might be new to us today. So we continue to update that with really current and relevant information for parents about what the trends are uh, with substance use. And so parent roles and rights, responsibilities, um, alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, and vaping, cannabis, and marijuana can all be found in that middle and high handbook. We've got parents, uh, foster parents, grandparents, uh, over 500 people on the call with us today, Dr. Danielle. And we wanna encourage them to you look at this as a very affordable resource, the Operation Parent Handbook. And then we're also going to provide a special offer for anybody who's joined us today. You're welcome to get 10% uh, off an individual parent handbook or a bulk offer if you just use the code SURPRISE10. And you can do that at Operation Parent backslash store. Um, it's a quick offer, so you'd want to take action um, today or very quickly because it ends on uh, Friday, February 16th at 11.59 p.m. and you'd have to have your order and your payment processed um, by that deadline to take advantage of that really great offer. 
I mean, it's Valentine's Day, so it's a really great time to order one of these and ship it to a relative, uh, a family, friend, a neighbor even, um, or to your child's school and just surround all those people that you love, um, put that protective factor around your teen, that there's good conversations going around substance use. We also have a new product um, that we've developed, TNT Trends and Training, and it's perfect for middle schoolers. And it is um, drug facts as well as working on refusal skills. So it's a complete program in a bucket. It's shipped right to your door and you can have a large scale prevention event with everything that you might need to do that and help uh, ramp up prevention in your school, church, community. Um, it can be utilized anywhere. And that's um, something that is uh, brand new for Operation Parent. And we're excited to let folks know about it. Our community advocates, um, Allie and Carol, if anyone's interested in reaching out, could let families know how it's being utilized across the country. We invite the audience, if you're not already, to follow us on our vibrant social media pages. We've got Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube uh, rocking, and we hope that you'll join us there to learn about future webinars as well as uh, get parenting support and tips um, that you can use as a parent or if you're a prevention specialist, you could share it with your community. All right, now we're going to dive into these most excellent questions that we were getting during the presentation. Um, so the first one, we were going to go back to the monitoring the future slide. And the question was, um, in this chart, the drinking reflecting, is it following the same children over time or is it total percentages based on what's happening today? So uh, what they do is they uh, essentially are sampling kids at a, at a snapshot. So it's cross, so some kids are followed across time, but it's a snapshot for where they are at any. So it's different cohorts of kids that have been enrolled at different periods. So it's really it's a combination of, of both in a sense because okay. they've been following kids for you know, uh, many decades now. And so they're, they're following them as they move through that period and then enrolling you know, the new ones each year as they are moving through that period. So it's okay. a really amazing resource for understanding patterns across time. Gotcha. So they're snapshotting at maybe like fifth, ninth grades. They're snapshotting at particular places uh, along the child's journey, right? Yes. And then they and through 12th is really this, you know, as they're moving from middle school to high school, um, which many of us who work with teens are particularly interested in. Fascinated by that for mm -hmm. sure. Um, how, how do you, a parent asks this question, how do you define um, the, I guess the percentage, how strong an edible is? So they, went on to say 80 to 90 percent. Is it by weight? Is it by concentration? Is it by THC content? That is by concentration of THC. So that is by the concentration of that act psychoactive ingredient. And um, that's why, and that's why it's so much so different from the drugs and the marijuana that you know existed. 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, because the concentration of that psychoactive ingredient used to be about 3%. Now it's about 25% um, from, and that is taken from drugs that are seized on the streets and that they run through drug labs. And so that's, you know, how they across time know that it's going up, 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 up. And it went up first in states where it was legal. Now, because it's become legalized so many places, that it's, you know, it went, we were shocked when it went up to 13%, then it went to 25%. And then when we started testing, you know, some of these gummies that they have a concentration of 80 to 90% of that psychoactive ingredient. So wow. that's, uh, that's obviously a very different drug than what many individuals were using even just a couple decades ago. 
Yeah, good point. So the concentration is so high and it's varying in like the time that it will take effect as well, it, right? So it is. And the other thing that I forgot to mention, but is important to about marijuana and studying cannabis is that because it has been scheduled, you know, classified as a schedule one drug, that it it makes it very hard for researchers to obtain it to do research. That means we can only buy it from certain government run labs where they are producing it. And what they are producing in those labs for research purposes is this very low potency marijuana that reflects the marijuana of you know, several decades ago. So there's very little research so far on what this far more potent drug is going to do in the long term as now we have you know generations of kids who are exposed to it who are using it even adults you know because there's just so little research because it has changed so quickly and it's been hard to do so we're really catching up to the fact that you know it's being legalized far before we understand actually the effects on the brain and some of these early studies are really giving us pause and you know anecdotally a lot of us who work in this space you know are also encountering a number of things that are concerning but we don't have great research yet and so um, that's something for parents to keep in mind mm -hmm. we'll continue to do this really great work right um yeah you shared with us so many things that you have established in your own home um, about your conversations and um, one parent wanted to know should we talk to our teens about the mistakes that we made along the way in, in substance use regards? Uh, I'm so glad you asked that I get that a lot from parents and what I always say is you know there's not a right answer to that question um, and it'll be different for every parent and how they feel about you know, uh, sharing and their relationship with their child. And so it is a choice that you can make. But what I do say to parents is, you are under no obligation to share. Your kids will inevitably ask you, right? They will say, well, you know, did you use alcohol or did you try drugs when you were an adolescent? You are under no obligation to share in the sense that, you know, if your kid asked you about your sex life, you would say, um, these things are private, right? We're not talking about me, we're talking about you. Mm -hmm. And so that is completely fine to also, you know, say, hey, this isn't about me, it's about you. And I think, you know, some of the other things that I like to have in my toolbox is the reality is we know a lot more about um, the effects of alcohol and other drugs on the brain than we did when I was younger. And unfortunately, what we know is that, you know, it's not good for developing brains. And, you know, we just didn't understand that nearly as much some time back. The other thing is that you were growing up in a different drug landscape, you know, in a different world than when I was a teenager. And unfortunately, it is a much scarier and more dangerous world. You know, even marijuana is so much stronger um, than it was, but other drugs now are so frequently mixed with, um, you know, with other drugs. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you used to be able to have a much better idea of what you were taking and the quantity in which you were taking it. And now it is really a mixed bag. And so it's, those things are very different than when I was an adolescent. And, you know, like I said, my go-to is, and my job as a parent is to keep you safe and to help you grow up, you know, to be healthy. And then you can make the decisions that are best for you, right? But right now I'm in charge of protecting your brain and your development. Mm -hmm. And so that's why these are the rules in our house. It's not about me. Unfortunately, you're growing up in a different world and we're talking about you. So that's, that's a little right. bit of how I handle it and some things that parents can kind of use. If you choose to share your experiences, then you can also do it in the sense, 
you know, that might be a way that you can talk to them about, you know, adverse consequences or things are different now, or, you know, you might choose to weave that in depending on what your experience was to your conversation with your child. I love I, all that advice. Yes. You what know, else do you I think? It, I would say also social media is very different today. Yes. And so if you're going to ask, um, what are your tips on their concern about easy access through social media? But you could take the social media uh, conversation whichever direction you think is relevant. <laughs> yeah, that was the other thing that I was going to mention there was that um, the other thing way that their world is so different is that everything is documented in a way that it was not when we were younger. And that is another reality of the fact that things that you, you know, did that you do when you're maybe young and, you know, still your brain's still developing, well, there can be a record of those and they can follow you. And that then can have, you know, adverse consequences on college admissions. It can have adverse consequences on jobs and you know, it, it is unfortunately a very different, um, more visible world with more of those kind of consequences because so much is documented um, via our new technology in ways that it wasn't when we were younger. So that's another thing parents can kind of remember and, um, and use in their conversations with their kids. Are you finding families talk with you about um, easier access or getting access of substances through social media means? So uh, certainly there are things that you can order off the internet in ways that you could not previously. A lot of kids are still getting their uh, access, you know, their alcohol or other drugs in the good old fashioned ways that you know we did when we were younger uh, as well too, meaning still the most common ways of accessing alcohol and other drugs is in the home or in their schools, i.e. you know their friends or in communities. And in fact, what we have found is that, you know, both with parental monitoring, you know, parents, they are underage, so they have to get it from somewhere to the extent that we can limit their access in our homes, in our communities, right? And making sure that if the word on the street is, oh, everybody knows that that gas station on the corner sells to underage kids. Well, mm -hmm. speak up, say something to it, talk to your local law enforcement. This is going on, this isn't okay. If they say, eh, not a big deal, find someone else who will listen, right? So there are things that we as parents can do to curb access. Um, most of them are not ordering it off the internet, though, of course, that is a possibility. And um, and having those conversations with your kids about their use of social media and, you know, um, and this is a whole other topic, but an important one for parents to be having with kids too. Good point. Um, how would you encourage a family to talk about substance use if there is misuse in the family by either a parent um, or a sibling? Could you give us some tips on how to maneuver through that? Absolutely. So I, I get this a lot in that parents mm -hmm. will ask me, you know, should I talk tell my kids if there is a family history, right? Should I tell my kids that maybe their parent who is no longer in the picture or their grandparents or, you know, my siblings, um, that, that there's substance use problems in the family. And I say, absolutely. In the same, and the fact that, you know, we, we wonder about that, I think just reminds us that there still is stigma surrounding substance use. And it's up to us to kind of break this down. And so, in the same way that if there were a history of heart attacks in your family, you would talk to your kids about, hey, the reality is cardiovascular disease runs in our family. And that means we have to be more careful about what we eat and, you know, how much we exercise. And, you know, we might need certain medications as you get older, et cetera, just to keep things healthy and kind of in a normal range. Substance use disorders are no different, right? that there is a genetic component to it. That means that you could be more at risk. And so 
the unfortunate reality is you might not be able to use substances in the same ways as your peers. Um, you might be more likely to develop problems and talk about that with them, et cetera. And you know, one of the things though is that no one is destined to develop problems. And so I think if there, is, there are family members, like you said, a sibling or a parent who is actively experiencing problems, you know, it's good for kids to one, realize that, you know, responding with empathy, that these are biomedical disorders. And if it runs in a family, you know, it can be challenging because some of the manifestations of when someone is in the throes of addiction, you know, can be so hurtful for those who are around them or love them. But to remember that, you know, there's partly genetic contributions. That means that you might be at elevated risk too, but it also means that does not mean that you are destined to develop problems, that the environment plays a role as well too. And if you see some of those risky tendencies in yourself, and we'll really get into this in March, right? Maybe you're more of a risk taker, your child's more of a risk taker, or maybe they're more prone toward anxiety or depression. And you know that, that sort of self-medication is something you've seen in your family. You wanna to talk to your kids about those pieces so they can be aware of that as well too. So I think key thing is yes, talk to your kids about it. You wanna to talk to them about how there is a genetic component, but no one is destined to develop problems. And when it comes to substances, in a sense, there's an easy environmental manipulation, which is they might choose not to use substances. That's, um, that's a perfect segue into our closing question. Um, what would you say to folks that are on with us to encourage them to come back and join us again in March? So a little preview, yes, for March. Today I talked a lot about general patterns in adolescent substance use and kind of generally what parents can do. But the running joke in my field is everyone is an environmentalist until you have your second child, meaning all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm doing all the same things and this one is turning out so different, whether it's, you know, baby one slept through the night and baby two, you know, was up screaming all night or, you know, whether it's child one is more introverted and they like to color in their room and child two is pushing the edge of the envelope and impulsive or those kind of things. And so what that really means is our kids are all different because our genes influence our dispositions, they influence the way our brains are wired. In the same way we can look around and see differences between us on the outside, there's a lot of differences between us on the inside too. And so that means that one size fits all parenting doesn't work for all kids. Our kids are all different. And so that's really what we're gonna get into next time. We talked a lot about generalities today with adolescence, development, use, general things that are good for all parents to do. Next time we're gonna dive into your kids, different types of kids, different types of dispositions, what kinds of things work better or worse for different types of kids, and which kids might be at particularly elevated risk that you really wanna be tuned into as a parent. I love that so much, especially the part where you say, like, it's never destiny. And as you start, you know, looking at things in your own family and then looking and working with um, your, your young kids and your teens, with these conversations prevention wise and otherwise earlier and earlier you just have this opportunity to just open up the relationship and really make a difference and so we thank you so much for your expertise today and all the things that you've made us think about all the homework you gave us um, to go and uh, work with our teens here over the next couple of nights and so we'll look forward to seeing you again in march and i um, encourage everyone on the call to head over to the website, operationparent.org and um, register for the next couple of webinars. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon.